So let's look at the following object experiment as we continue looking at graphs and key features such as domain, range, y-intercept, min, max. The first question, I want you to just take a guess. The Empire State Building in New York City is 1,454 feet tall. How long do you think it will take a penny drop from the top of the Empire State Building to hit the ground? And so you, you might just think about it and say, imagine dropping a penny. Don't actually do this. If you ever go, I think it's pretty illegal because of the danger it represents to the people below. But if you did drop a penny from the very top of the building, which is one of the taller buildings in New York, how long do you think it would take for the penny to reach the ground? Maybe like five, six seconds, 10, 15 30, 40, how long do you think it would take for a penny to reach the ground? Well, in 1589, the mathematician and scientist Galileo conducted an experiment to answer a question much like the one in item one. Remember, math and science, it pretty much goes together in the higher levels of those classes. You'll always be doing a little bit of math and science, and, it'll, and most of the examples in math will just will be science kind of thing, so they just kind of blend together. Galileo dropped the balls from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy and determined the time it took them to reach the ground. Galileo used several balls identical in shape but differing in mass. So think like baseball versus tennis ball versus bowling ball. Same shape but different masses. Because the balls all reached the ground in the same amount of time, he developed the theory that all objects fall at the same rate. Galileo's finding can be represented with the equation h of t. See, we're going to use h of t instead of f of t just because we're talking about height for h. Just the way, remember, function notation is a way to name functions. h of t is equal to 1600 minus 16 times t squared. So instead of x, we're using t's because we're talking about time. We're going to make a table of values for Galileo's function. So let's think about it. All we need to do is replace the t's with these numbers and work them out. 1600 minus 16 t squared, so it'll be 1600 minus 16 times 0 squared, which is 1600. Sixteen hundred minus 16 times 1 squared, which is 1600 minus 16, or 1584. 15, and just continue on filling out this chart using the numbers for your in your time, your seconds, and replacing them into this function and getting answers. We'll give everybody just a couple seconds. So you can pause the video and do it so we can see if you've done it done it right. Okay, let me just show you right here. Here are the numbers. Okay, we already had 1600 right there, 1584 there. The next ones would be 1536, 1456, 1344, 1200, 1024, 816, 576, 304, and 0. And we're just each time you replace T with your value of T right here and worked it out and you would get these numbers. So why do you think negative domain values do not are not appropriate in this situation? If you remember in lesson six, three, we talked about reasonable domain. Why do you, this is our domain values, T. Why do you think it's negative do not make any sense? Because we cannot go backwards in time. Zero is where he starts from. Okay, we can't say that at negative five seconds, he doesn't travel backwards in time. We only go forwards. What would a negative range value mean if this is 1,600 feet and it goes to zero? What would it mean if it was a negative range value, like negative five? It would probably mean like below 
sea level or underneath the ground. Okay, so now use those tables of values that you got, and we're going to graph this function. Okay, we're going to say like a point here at 0, 1600, and then 1, 1584, and then 2, 1536. See, and we're just going to graph the points. Okay, where is it? And then it would have been like 14. I didn't save the numbers. So hold on just a second. Fourteen fifty-six. Okay, so it was sixteen hundred, fifteen eighty-four, fifteen thirty-six, fourteen eighty-six. So about right there. No, fifty-six. I'm sorry, fourteen fifty-six. And then thirteen forty-four. So about right here. Uh, Twelve hundred right there 1024 1024 right about there 816 right about there 576 576 right about here and then 304 and then zero. So if you graph it using these values on this table, this is sort of what it would look like. It's not a straight line, it's a curve, okay? At first, it takes it a couple of seconds to even break out 100 feet, but then it starts speeding up, okay? Accelerating as it falls, and the gap between the numbers get bigger and bigger. So let's think about what the reasonable domain is for this graph. Reasonably, it's from 0 to 10. Okay, the domain is going to be 0 is less than or equal to the time it takes, which is less than or equal to 10. A reasonable range, okay, is from 0 to 1600. 0 is less than or equal to the height which is less than or equal to 1,600. Okay, that would be reasonable domains, time, your independent variable, and range, height, your dependent variable. How high you are depends on how much time has passed. Okay, there we go. Here's the domain range written for you. All right, what's the y-intercept? Where does it cross this y-axis? Or even the h-axis, since we're talking about height, but it's the same concept, y-axis, y-intercept. It's going to be right there at 1,600. Y-intercept is going to be 0. When x is 0, y is 1,600. Okay, see, it's very easy to get the y-intercept. It's whenever it's zero, where is the y? That's the definition. What does it represent? It just represents that before you even dropped the ball, you started at a height of 1,600. Then what would the x-intercept be? x-intercept would be 10, 0. Now, we haven't talked too much about x-intercept, but it's very similar to the y-intercept. It's where it crosses the uh, x-axis, I mean, when y is 0. So it's sort of like the reverse. The x-intercept will be 10, 0 as an ordered pair. When x is 10, y will be equal to 0. That's the x-intercept right there. And what does it mean? It means after 10 seconds, the ball hits the ground. Okay, 10, 0. Number of seconds it takes to reach the ground. What are the, sorry, what are the extrema? 
okay the minimum and maximums we have minimum and maximums on this one because we have endpoints unlike when we'd had the graphs that had arrows at the end sometimes we didn't have minimum and maximums depending on what the shape of the graph was this one we do have an absolute minimum and an absolute maximum absolute maximum is 1600 absolute minimum is zero okay minimum and maximum are also known as the extrema minimum and maximums where they're ex the extreme points the very top and the very bottom okay just saying exactly what we just said okay Let me turn this off so that we can do the next one together. All right, so if your teacher gives you this function and there's no situation with it, we don't need to restrict the domain then, okay? There's no limitations by real-world situations if they just give you the function without any story behind it. So here's our function, x squared minus 2x. And we're going to want to fill out a chart, a table of points, by uh, input, output. We're going to pick some numbers and put them in our inputs. We're going to put them in our equation and work them out and see what we get out as our outputs. Then we'll take those points and we'll graph it and see if there's any discrepancies, any differences between this and the domain of Galileo's function, the range, y-intercept, absolute maximum. Okay, so let's see. Easy numbers. Okay, it says use a different types of domain. That means positive and negative. You need to do a little bit of both. But we're going to just pick some numbers. Let's say zero. That's a very easy one to do. Zero squared is zero minus two times zero, zero. Okay, negative one. Uh, negative one squared is one minus two times negative one, which is negative two. So one minus negative two, that's three. Let's do positive one. 1 squared is 1, minus 2 times 1 is 2, 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Uh, let's do, uh, let's say, 2. Okay, when x is 2, that'll be 2 squared is 4, minus 2 times 2, which is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. Okay, let's do negative 2. Uh, negative 2 squared is 4 minus 2 times negative 2, which is negative 4. 4 minus negative 4 is actually 4 plus 4, which is 8. Okay. Three. Might as well. Three squared is... 9 minus 2 times 3, which is 6. 9 minus 3, uh, no, 9 minus 6 is 3. Okay, then we come and put those on this graph down here. So 0, 0. Negative 1, 3. Negative 1, 3. 2, 1, negative 1. 1, negative 1. 2, 0, 2, 0, negative 2, 8, negative 2, 8, 3, 3, 3, 3. Okay, and so you can kind of see that this is making a parabola. If I could draw straight, sort of, and we just keep going like this, this one keep going. Like that. That's the sort of shape this would make on a graph. And all we had to do was just pick points. Now, I picked some small points just because our graph didn't have that many going left, right, up, or down. It only goes up to 10 on each one. So I don't want to pick any points like 50 or something like that that I couldn't even graph. I want to pick just a couple of small points that I could graph on that one. What's the difference between this domain and the domain of Galileo's function? Well, this domain is all real numbers because it's going to be 
negative infinity this way, positive infinity that way, all real numbers. The Galileo function only went from 0 to 10. Okay, So the difference is this one doesn't have any restrictions on the domain. The Galileo's problem did have a restriction on the domain. It started at 0 and it ended at 10. What's the range of this one? Well, the range, it goes up into infinity. Okay, It goes up into infinity on both sides. But it does have a minimum, okay, at negative one, one negative one, I meant. So th this one has a range from negative one to infinity. Okay, negative one is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to infinity. That's one way to say it. We could use interval notation and say negative one. This would be a bracket because it's included negative one infinity. We would use open circles because we have, can't include something we never get to. Y intercept zero. Y intercept is zero zero. That's where it crosses the y axis. And then the absolute maximum of this one. All right, there is no absolute maximum. It goes up forever, so there's no absolute maximum. But there is an absolute minimum, negative one. I'm sorry, one, negative one. But no absolute maximum. No max. All right, so if you want to try these you can it's more same thing you're going to make a table you're going to graph the function after you make the table where you just pick some points to replace your width and then find what the area of the rectangle is give a reasonable domain for the function which probably means you can't have like negative widths or distances you have to go from like zero to the positive versions, uh, infinity, positive infinity. So all the real numbers, or not all real, not all real numbers, because you can't include the negatives. But you could say like from zero to infinity, the positive ones. It's greater than or equal to zero, probably is what the domain would be. And then y-intercept. Where would this cross on the y-axis? And then absolute maximum and infinite absolute minimums. Remember, you can graph these on the Desmos calculator at desmos.com, D-E-S-M-O-S dot -S com. If you click on these buttons, you can get there this way and you can do it inside the problems. But if you need to, you can just go over here, let's see right there, desmos.com and then graph, the cal graph your functions this way. Let me cancel this out. Hold on, just a second. So, try these. And then we'll be through with this lesson.